I believe that scientific views of reality are entirely compatible with a religious worldview. I believe that the concern of science is to investigate the mechanism and the concern of religion is to explore the nature of God who uses the mechanism. The key point is that science and religion go together about to illustrate it, firstly with an illustration and secondly with a story. And the illustration is this one. Imagine a kiss. I first heard this used by my RE teacher back when I was doing GCSE RE. Um, back in those days, he couldn't do this now. He called to the front two members of the class who were boyfriend and girlfriend, and they did a little practical demonstration. I'm not going to do that with you this morning. But consider a kiss. What is it? How would you define it? A scientist may define a kiss in this way. A kiss is the approach of two pairs of lips with the reciprocal transmission of microorganisms and carbon dioxide. What's wrong with that? There's a perfect scientific explanation, a definition of what a kiss is in scientific terms. The approach of two pairs of lips with the reciprocal transmission of microorganisms and carbon dioxide. It says it all, doesn't it? We're deeply dissatisfied with that kind of explanation. We know there must be more. A scientific explanation isn't enough. We need another kind of explanation as well, what we might call a personal explanation. An explanation that makes reference to the intentions of persons. Persons who want to express their commitment to one another, who want to express their undying love towards one another, who want to express a bit of romance. The two explanations sit side by side. We need them both in order to have a complete explanation of what a kiss is. A scientific explanation and a personal explanation. Why must we assume that the scientific explanation is the only kind of explanation there is? Science, in short, is not enough. Here's my story. It's called Mice and the Piano, and it was the Rev who first brought this to my attention. Imagine a family of mice who lived all their lives in a large piano. To them in the piano world came the music of the instrument, filling all the dark spaces with sound and harmony. At first the mice were impressed by it. They drew comfort and wonder from the thought that there was someone who made the music, though invisible to them, above and yet close to them. They loved to think of the great player whom they could not see. Then one day, a daring mouse climbed up part of the piano and returned, very thoughtful. He had found out how the music was made. Wires were the secret. Tightly stretched wires of graduated lengths which trembled and vibrated. They must revise their old beliefs. None but the most conservative could any longer believe in the unseen player. Later, another explorer carried the explanation further. Hammers were now the secret. Numbers of hammers dancing and leaping on the wires. This was a more complicated theory, but it all went to show that they lived in a purely mechanical and mathematical world. The unseen player came to be thought of as a myth, but the pianist continued to play. See the point of the story? The mice happened upon a complete explanation of how the sounds in the piano were made in in terms of physical laws. They understood that when a hammer hits a wire, it causes the wire to vibrate at a particular frequency that depends on the length of the wire and the thickness of the wire. They knew it all. By their scientific inquiry, they came across a complete explanation of how the sounds were produced. And yet, what they thought was a complete explanation was anything but. Because it made no reference to the fact that behind the laws of physics, there was a great pianist who was using those laws of physics in order to produce the music that he had it in mind to play. You see, a scientific explanation is not the only kind of explanation that there is. Sometimes we need different levels of explanation, different kinds of explanation that don't contradict one another. They actually sit alongside one another. In order to have a complete picture of reality, we need to hold the two together. This is a rather crude scheme, but it's helpful for our purposes. Consider what the role of science is. Science is concerned with how questions how things came into existence, how things come to be the way they are. Religion is concerned with why questions, why things exist, why they are as they are. Science is concerned with seeking to understand something in terms of its simpler components. Religion is concerned with seeking to understand something in terms of its purpose. Why must we believe that science and religion are pulling in different directions, when actually both are concerned with addressing what reality is like, but from different angles, different perspectives? They're answering different questions, and we need to hold the two together in order to have a complete picture of reality. If this sounds very theoretical, let me give a real example. Let me ground this a little bit in real life. In the 19th century, both Buckland and Darwin were very impressed by what came to be called transitional forms that surfaced in the fossil record. 
Some of these were starting to come to light in the 19th century. The term transitional form was probably coined by Buckland himself. A transitional form is simply this. It's a kind of organism that shares characteristics of two quite different kinds of organisms. It sits, if you like, midway between two different populations of organisms or two different species of organisms, sharing the characteristics of them both. A classic example, which came to light in 1860, after the lifetime of Buckland, but well within the lifetime of Charles Darwin, is this creature, Archaeopteryx. Six specimens have been found, one of the most famous, one of the most valuable fossils ever discovered. An Archaeopteryx shares characteristics of both reptiles and of birds. How do we explain the occurrence of such transitional forms in the fossil record? Darwin had an explanation. The explanation is this, that the transitional forms show that all living creatures are related with, to one another. They're all branches on the evolutionary tree of life. In other words, the existence of transitional forms points to the existence of a single ancestor from which all contemporary living organisms are descended. Buckland had a different kind of explanation. The existence of transitional forms shows the unity of nature, which points not to the existence of a sin single ancestral form, but points to the idea that they all come from the same mind, the mind of a great creator. Why must we assume that these explanations are contradictory. They're not. They complement one another. The idea that all living organisms come from a single ancestral form and all come from a single mind, a single intelligence, these are explanations that actually can coincide with one another perfectly happily. This, here's Buckland's own quote. All living forms were parts of one great system of creation, all bearing marks of derivation from a common author. Whenever I talk on this subject, I like to share this quote that comes from Francis Bacon, one of the great architects of the scientific method. Francis Bacon isn't read very much today, but very many people, countless, thousands of people have read this quote. Bacon wrote that no man think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or in the book of God's works, but rather let men endeavor an endless progress or proficiency in both. Francis Bacon was committed to the view that there's the book of God's words, the Bible, and there's the book of God's works, which is nature. And these two things aren't contradictory, they're not putting in different directions. We must hold the two together to have a single coherent view of reality. Let men endeavor an endless proficiency in both. Let men give themselves to the diligent study of both, for then we might know reality as it truly is. Why have so many thousands of people read this quote? The answer is, it's found in the preface of Darwin's Origin of Species. These are the very first words that you read when you pick up Darwin's own book. This quote is quoted with Darwin's approval. Let men endeavor an endless proficiency in both, holding a scientific explanation and a religious explanation together. And that really is the main point that I want to put forward to you this morning about what I believe to be the true relationship between science and religion. They complement they don't contradict. But as an afterthought, really, I want to just return to where I started and talk a little bit about wonder. This is Buckland's Megalosaurus. This is the fossil of the first dinosaur ever scientifically described back in 1824, when this fossil came into Buckland's possession. You can go and see it for yourself. Go to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and you can stand there in front of the display and see the remains of this magnificent creature. As an undergraduate studying at Oxford, I used to work in the Radcliffe Science Library just across the green from the Oxford Museum of Natural History. It was there I read my essays, it was there I studied, it was there I revised for my finals. And every now and again, the weight of all that study was heavy on my shoulders, and it was dull, and it was repetitive, and it was difficult. And many of you are going to experience exactly the same as you come to prepare for your GCSEs, and next year, as you prepare for your ASs and the year after as you prepare for your A2s, there are times in your life when you feel the weight of study on your shoulders very keenly. What do you do at those moments? What I did was this. I looked out of my window, saw the museum there, took a break, walked across the green, went and stood before Buckland's Megalosaurus, and that had something of that original childlike wonder that spurred me on to study science to fill my life again. I believe that we all need to nurture that capacity for wonder in our lives. And so I end with where I started, with Diplodocus, which is for me a symbol of childlike wonder in the face 
of the extraordinary complexity, the extraordinary um, awesomeness of the world in which we find ourselves. If we are going to be men and women who give ourselves to study, give ourselves to understanding reality, we need to be motivated, we need to be enthused, we need to be inspired, we need to be energized. Where are we going to get that from? It comes from wonder. Wonder in the face of the universe. We need to nurture that. And I finish with this point because I believe that this is what characterizes a true philosopher. You remember right at the beginning of my presentation I said, in the sixth form here we offer a course in the philosophy of religion. What is it that marks out a philosopher from the rest? A philosopher is not just someone who gives himself or herself to a formal course in philosophical studies, although that will help you. A philosopher is someone who looks at the world through eyes of wonder. He's just amazed at what he or she sees. Who isn't content with pat answers. Who isn't content with superficial explanations. Who has an insatiable appetite to know, to learn, to discover, and to inquire. And I want to conclude with this quote that comes from this book, Sophie's World. Highly recommended book, a brilliant introduction to the history of Western philosophy. It's about a teenage girl, Sophie, who comes into contact with a philosopher called Alberto Knox. And originally, Alberto Knox corresponds with Sophie by writing her letters. Later in the book, they meet in person. He starts to give her philosophy tutorials. And she's taken on a journey of discovery. She learns what true philosophy is all about. And in his original letter to Sophie, Alberto Knox writes these words. The only thing we require to be good philosophers is the faculty of wonder. Babies have this faculty. That's not surprising. After a few short months in the womb, they slip out into a brand new reality. But as they grow up, the faculty of wonder seems to diminish. And in doing so, they lose something central, something philosophers try to restore. For somewhere deep inside ourselves, something tells us that life is a huge mystery. To be more precise, although philosophical questions concern us all, we do not all become philosophers. For various reasons, most people get so caught up in everyday affairs that their astonishment at the world gets pushed into the background. To children, the world, and everything in it is new. Something that gives rise to astonishment is not like that for adults. Most adults accept the world as a matter of course. This is precisely where philosophers are a notable exception. A philosopher never gets quite used to the world. To him or her, the world continues to seem a bit unreasonable, bewildering, even enigmatic. Philosophers and small children thus have an important faculty in common. You might say that throughout, throughout his life, a philosopher remains as thin-skinned as a child. So now, you must choose. Have you become world-weary, or are you a philosopher who will vow never to become so? You've been a magnificent audience. Thank you for your attention. I finish there. The question was, um, I focused exclusively on evolutionary theory in my presentation this morning, but how do my thoughts about the relationship between science and religion inform the way that we should think about the Big Bang, about cosmological questions? Is that a fair summary of the question? It's an excellent question. And there wasn't time this morning to go into that. Some of you will have heard in the media recently Professor Stephen Hawking of Cambridge University uh, in, in his new book, um, and he's got, he wants to sell a lot of copies, and you sell a lot more copies of books if you refer to God somewhere in it. Um, in his new book, he says he doesn't believe that the God, God hypothesis is needed to explain the existence of the universe, that spontaneous creation is responsible, solely responsible for the universe as we find it. Um, I, I could be a little bit cheeky and say you'll, you'll find out some answers to your question if you study philosophy of religion next year when you study the 1948 uh, debate between uh, two great philosophers of the 20th century called Bertrand Russell and Frederick Copleston. But uh, in a nutshell, let, let me summarize my own views on this. And I'll return to that, that scheme that I set out, that science is concerned with how questions and religion is concerned with why questions. Science is concerned with the question of how the universe came into existence how it comes to be in the way that it is. And it talks about Big Bang Theory, it talks about gravitational forces, um, it talks about forces uh, that are responsible for stars exploding, large stars exploding near the end of their life, supernovae which spread elements across the universe. 
Um, all of that is concerned with the how. How the universe comes to be in the way that it is. But religion is concerned with quite different questions. It's concerned with why. Why does the universe exist? Why did the universe, why did the evolutionary process that's taking place in the universe, has been taking place in the universe for the past 13.6 billion years, culminated in the existence of consciousness, conscious beings such as ourselves? Why? And my belief is that science is powerless to answer those questions. Science is very good at answering the how questions, but it's completely powerless when it comes to answering the why questions. Why are we here? It's not a scientific question. It's a different kind of question altogether. And it's only religious explanations of reality that are able to respond, in my view, adequately to that kind of, that kind of question. Now, you can, you can kick the problem straight into the long grass and say, well, the questions that religion tries to answer aren't legitimate questions at all. We've got no right even to ask the question, why are we here? Why do we exist? Why is there a universe? That, for me, is unsatisfactory. I think that these questions are so deep and are universal that there's something in us that longs for answers to those questions. And I repeat, science cannot answer them. The kinds of answers that we're looking for when we ask why questions are beyond the remit of contemporary science. Does that make sense, Ellie? That there's a little bit of a response. So again, I hold, I hold together the idea that a scientific understanding of the universe, we could talk about Big Bang Theory, and a religious explanation of the universe actually complement one another, they go hand in hand. Right, my, my question was, and um, you, you were uh, picking on my uh, child illustration right at the end there. Children are ignorant of many things. Was I implying that it's a good thing to remain ignorant of, of reality in the way that a child is? Absolutely not. Um, I think that's a profoundly dissatisfying way to live. We can all be content with our understanding as it is at this moment. But what I want to see instilled in all of you, what I want to nurture in me, is an inquisitiveness and a desire to find out more. My, the purpose of me talking about uh, uh, the, um, the attitude of a child, the mindset of a child, right at the conclusion of my address, was, was not to talk about ignorance at, all, ignorance at all, but to talk about wonder. I've got a young son, he's 14 months old, and it's a, des and it's a delight to watch him as he discovers things for the first time. And you see the, the, the smile spread across his features when he, he's able to understand something, or he sees something, or experiences something he's never experienced before. Um, he's filled with awe at this world in which he finds himself. And I would love for that same mindset to be your mindset, and to motivate you in your, uh, in, in your intellectual endeavors, wherever they may take you in the future. So no, ignorance, ab absolutely bad thing. And, and my, my view is, that we should follow a line of questioning through to whatever, to wherever it takes us, to whatever conclusion it takes us to, even if we find the consequences of that conclusion profoundly uncomfortable. We must never be content with ignorance. Okay? There were lots of hands over here just a moment ago. There still are. Um, start with Ed. Is it Ed? I can't see because it's so dark. Sorry, um, the, um, the giant stock has become extinct, yeah. and um, one of the arguments is designed by God. And if everything is designed by God, then surely it's being designed to become extinct mm. in the end. So, why? The short answer is I don't know. <laughs> a, a, a longer answer is I, I think um, biologists think that. Over 99%, 99 point something percent, of all living organisms that have ever existed on this planet are now extinct. So the, the, the problem that you put your finger on is a very real one. It doesn't just relate to things like the megatherium, the giant ground slope, but a whole host of other things as well. Why did God allow such things to become extinct? I don't know. Um, but I suspect the answer is something like this. Um, I think it increases our awe in the face of nature. I think it opens our eyes to the fact that we live on a planet on which life has been evolving for 13.7 billion years, 13,700 million years. And I think that that breaks us out of our own little narrow-minded parochial worldview and enables us to open up our minds and give ourselves to study of something that's vastly more exciting, vastly more counterintuitive than we can ever, ever have imagined. Um, 
And I haven't really got very much more to say on it than that, because I think there's, from a, a theological perspective, there's a profound mystery around that very question. So my idea is just my idea, really. Yeah, down the front. Yeah, if, I, if I'd had time this morning, I would have talked to you a little bit about how I believe that, how I believe the book of Genesis, Genesis sorry, it should be properly interpreted. Of course, there's a breadth of opinion on this within theology, um, among Christians themselves. Um, I trust that you've all read or studied aspects of the Genesis creation accounts at some point over the last five years since you started at Troy School. It's my view that what we find in the book of Genesis is not a literal, historical, scientific account of how God created but you know, I come back to my how-why distinction. I think the book of Genesis is concerned with answering theological questions rather than scientific ones. I think it's concerned with giving us answers to the, answers to the why questions, why we are here, rather than how God created. Um, a six-day creation scheme that we find in Genesis 1 is totally incompatible with a scientific worldview if we interpret the book of Genesis literally. No question. Um, those who hold to what we call young earth creationism believe that the book of Genesis points to a universe that's between 6,000 and 10,000 years old. That is totally incompatible with the modern scientific view that the universe is about 13.6 billion years old and the earth is about 14.5 billion years old. No question. Um, but I believe that the book of Genesis, written as it was before the scientific age, written by people who um, weren't actually interested in asking or finding answers to scientific questions, shouldn't be read as a scientific textbook. The texts are actually addressing quite different questions altogether. You asked about the flood as well, but I've not got time to go there. But a, a, simi a, a similar answer would suffice for that example you cited. I think one more question. Yeah. Well, I, I would um, disagree with you there. I, I think that science can talk about what's happening in the nervous system in terms of neuronal um, neuron um, impulses and in terms of um, chemicals being secreted in the brain and, um, and, and so on, neurotransmitters. Um, but I don't think that science does give us an adequate explanation of emotions. And I don't think that science gives us an adequate explanation of what it means to be a conscious person, a person as opposed to an organism. I don't think science can properly explain what it means for us to be human. Um, now, you could come back and say, oh, well, our understanding of science is still fairly rudimentary, and in the future, there's every reason to suppose that we will have a complete scientific explanation of something like the kids. Um, that is an interesting hypothesis, um, but is based on a host of assumptions. Um, if, if that were to be your response, or if someone else were to respond to me in that way. Um, our understanding of what goes on in the human body to explain the, the remarkable, vibrant world that we exist in as human persons, um, it's, it's, it's my view that, that science uh, still has a long way to go in providing a complete explanation, and actually I don't think it ever will. I think there will all, always be scope for a religious explanation, which is a personal explanation sitting along a scientific one. My purpose in talking about the kiss was not to talk specifically about God. I don't think you bring in God to explain what a kiss is. My purpose in talking about the kiss was simply to put in your, in your minds the idea that there, are, there can be different levels of explanation, different kinds of explanation which can sit together rather than contradict one another. So even if I were to accept fully your argument, that science does fully explain something like a kiss, and a complete scientific definition of a kiss is forthcoming, it still doesn't take away my conclusion that when we ask different kinds of questions, like what does it mean to be human, or why do we exist, what is our purpose, actually requires a religious explanation, and not just a scientific one. So I've got two answers to your question. 
One is to agree with you to a, to a point and say, but actually, my main conclusion in my presentation still stands. My second answer, which I gave first, confusingly, is that I don't think actually science does provide us with a complete explanation of the case in any case. 